Hello ladies and gentlemen, my name is David Pembroke and on behalf of the Department of Agriculture I'd like to welcome you to this webinar on the Water Efficiency Program. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the Ngunnawal people of the Ngunnawal Nation who are the traditional custodians of the land on which we're broadcasting today. I'd like to pay my respects to their elders both past and present of the Ngunnawal Nation. So here is what we are going to cover today. In line with some of the feedback from our previous webinar, today we will discuss the eligibility requirements for on-farm irrigation projects. We'll explain how that works for both project partners and delivery partners. We'll look at the requirements of meeting the efficiency measures agreed criteria for all projects. We'll also be taking questions from you in this webinar, so if you do have a question at any stage, please type them into the Q&A box on your screen and you are very much encouraged to do so. We are ready to take your questions and we'll be answering them as we go through the second half of the webinar. I'd now like to introduce our expert for today. Tony Bigwood is the Director of Efficiency Measures Water Recovery Branch at the Department of Agriculture. Good afternoon to you, Tony. Thanks, David. Good to be here. Welcome to all our participants. And we also have, as part of the team, we have Krista and Joe, who will be here to receive your questions and to help with the answers as we go through today. But before we begin, just on behalf of the department, thank you very much for attending today's webinar. So, the Webinar Efficiency Program is not the first of its kind. The Commonwealth has a lot of experience in managing efficiency measured programs, doesn't it, Tony? That's correct, David. The Commonwealth has experience and the capacity to run water efficiency programs. Um, the Commonwealth has run on-farm programs and funded state-managed on-farm programs since 2008. The biggest program was the On-Farm Irrigation Efficiency Program, OFEP, as most people will know it which ran in New South Wales, Victoria and South Australia at various times and funded almost 1,500 on-farm projects. There were also on-farm projects managed under the Private Irrigation Infrastructure Operators Program, PIOP, um, which funded big, mostly off-farm infrastructure in New South Wales, but also on-farm works. <clears throat> Uh, the Commonwealth also ran the Commonwealth On-Farm Further Irrigation Efficiency Pilot program, which was coffee, which was my invention. Coffee was the name I thought of. I thought it was a great name. <laughs> In South Australia, as the first on-farm efficiency measures program. Um, and in addition, Queensland, New South Wales, Victoria and South Australia <clears throat> all ran on-farm irrigation efficiency programs or on behalf of the Commonwealth. The Healthy Headwaters Water Use Efficiency Project program in Queensland, Huey, uh, irrigated farm modernisation in New South Wales, the Victorian Farm Modernisation Program, VFM, and SARSM, which is the South Australian River Murray Sustainability Program. <coughs> the Water Efficiency Program, the new program, takes the best of that experience and has been designed for projects in the Murray-Darling Basin. If, if a project was eligible under those programs, you'll be eligible under the, the new program. Okay, so we've been hearing a lot um, about the Murray-Darling Basin in recent times. Why is it that the water efficiency program is only running in the basin? The Murray-Darling Basin covers a million square kilometres of southeastern Australia, across Queensland, New South Wales, the ACT, Victoria and South Australia, and includes more than 40 Aboriginal nations. The Murray-Darling Basin Plan was put in place because of deep concerns about the sustainability of the basin for the future. The department aims to help basin communities become more efficient and productive in water use while also restoring the river systems. The water efficiency program is providing 1.5 billion to improve water efficiency and deliver the last 450 gigalitres of water for the environment by 2024. As we've said, this water may be water that was previously lost, such as through seepage, evaporation and leaks, but which can be captured and returned to the environment to help the basin system more resilient in a changing climate. 
The program funding helps basin businesses to invest in modernising water infrastructure to increase water efficiency and generate water savings. In return for project funding, participants agree to transfer some of the water savings to the Commonwealth. Participants also get to use or keep a share of the water savings for their own use. The Basin Plan estimates a sustainable diversion limit of 10,945 gigalitres a year. That's a lot. It's about 10 million Olympic-sized swimming pools. It's 100 times the amount of water that Adelaide takes from the Murray and 240 times what Canberra's water use. And that, you know, Canberra is in the basin. It, it relies on the Murrumbidgee, essentially. The basin produces 24 billion of food and fibre each year, including 7 billion from irrigated agriculture, and has an estimated 9,500 irrigated agricultural businesses. The tourism industry within the basin is worth $8 billion. 85% of the water use in the basin is for irrigation, and most of that is on farm. While the department is working with states and industry on projects in the off-farm, urban and industrial streams, we would also like to, and we would like to get a substantial amount of water from projects in those streams. We're also interested in supporting irrigators that want funding for projects to upgrade their on-farm infrastructure. Okay, thanks Tony. So we're going to proceed now expecting that people who have joined us today are aware of the program and are looking for some information to see if their possible proposal is suitable or how to address the requirements of meeting the efficiency measures agreed criteria for all projects. So with that in mind, how do people know if the project they have in mind is suitable for consideration? So there are five streams to the Water Efficiency Program, and we've talked about those in our last seminar. Uh, there's uh, the there's, uh, urban, industrial, off-farm, metering and on-farm, and there's a long, long list of eligible projects which you can find on our website. So it's much more than pipes and drainage systems. So your pipes are important, but there's much more to irrigation than new pipes. The Water Efficiency Program allows for installation of new equipment or the upgrading of existing systems, and it also covers associated technology and infrastructure. The Water Efficiency Program is providing, as I said before, $1.5 billion to improve water efficiency and deliver 450 gigalitres of water for the environment by 2024. As we've said, that water, that may be water that was previously lost, such as through seepage, evaporation and leaks, but which can be captured and returned to the environment to help make the basin system more resilient in the changing climate. Water recovery, remember, is a means to an end. The basin supports, the basin plan supports the health of the basin for all users, current and future. Mm. So we are in a drought. So why would anyone want to do a water efficiency project now and give up water? It's a, it's a good question. And it's, a, it's, it's, and on the face of it, there are, it's, it's, a, it's a really good question because some irrigators don't have any water at the moment. Um, but for those that do, 15 months ago, water entitlements were worth half what they are now, which means that an irrigator gives up half as much water and they get the same amount of money for their water efficiency infrastructure as they, as they would have got 15 months ago. So if a water savings proposal to go from flood to drip irrigation, so from flood irrigation to drip irrigation, costs $200,000, an irrigator would have had to give up 40 megalitres of high security water to fund that project 15 months ago. Now it's 20 megalitres of water, but the project would still save typically 50 or 60 megalitres of water. So all the water saved beyond that given up is retained by the irrigator. So that water is available to the irrigator to sell, to use instead of buying allocation water, or to increase their irrigation area. That middle point is probably the most relevant to many irrigators at the moment, as they rely on a mix of their own water and allocation that they buy. And allocation water has got rather expensive recently, and reducing an irrigator's reliance on it will give them a substantial amount of money. Projects can also increase yields or increase quality, for example, moving from traditional dairy to shedded dairy with fodder can both save a significant amount of water and increase milk production. Fruit and vegetable quality can be improved from, through moving to drip, overhead spray for cooling and shading, and all of those components of a project would be eligible. 
We are looking for water savings, but landholders are reporting many additional benefits, including being able to operate their irrigation equipment remotely, giving them more time for other activities, including more leisure time. There was one, at, uh, Mary was at a conference recently where an irrigator was talking about them being, in fact, overseas. They were in London or somewhere like that. Mm -hmm. And they could turn on their irrigation equipment from their iPad. <laughs> so it's sort of, which is pretty amazing when you think about it. Yeah. <clears throat> um, suitable projects may see installation of pressurised overhead spray or surface drip systems or a surface gravity and pipe and riser system. But we're also looking at improving and irrigated area. This could mean laser GPS levelling of paddocks, reshaping embankments and other land forming. You may already be using irrigation and need a better filtration or water reuse and drainage system. Switching to hydroponics could save you water. To be eligible, projects need to generate water savings. So do all water saving activities involve irrigation? Um, no, there are plenty of other ways to improve water efficiency on farms. And if it's going to give water savings, it may be eligible. So water savings, soil treatments and mulches are on the list. Changing to non-irrigation production systems, changing water supply from river water to recycle, desalination of groundwater. Uh, you can look at improvements in energy efficiency, such as solar power systems, which are eligible. So you can save funding that way, save money income what, that way. It's also possible to put in more more efficient perennial crop varieties, which often also have a higher value to the grower and to value add to, at the farm gate. So can you give me an example of value adding? So there are, there are a lot of examples that I can give, but one I particularly like is a date grower in South Australia who did a water savings irrigation project, but also value added to part of their crop. So previously the seconds of their dates were just buried on the property, but after the project, those seconds were chopped and bagged and sold to the confectionery industry, adding to an income stream from what was previously a waste stream. Mm, okay. So, um, how about we take a closer look at the eligible projects? So you'll see a complete list on our website, but there are there's some big categories you can, you can think about. So there's the, the ones we've talked about, the pressurised overhead spray or surface strip systems. There's the, the typical, uh, I mean, what you often see in dairy, the surface or gravity flood and pipe and riser irrigation systems, mm -hmm. um, improving irrigated area layout or design, including cheap laser levelling, uh, and all the things that go with that, like water filtration, fertigation and dosing systems. Do We often use water reuse, so having a, a dam at the bottom end of a... Of a of a laser leveled area which enables water to be captured and pumped back up to the, the top of the, the paddock and then reused again. So that's the typical sort of irrigation upgrade stuff that you'll see all the time. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that many farmers have found is having the soil monitoring systems really save a lot of water. So having probes in so that so that plants only get the amount of water that they need rather than the amount of water that you think they need. So then you can do um, other, other systems like automated water management systems, the installation upgrading of flow control regulators, remote sensing, telemetry, all those sorts of things. Uh, there's even within the, the uh, stock, stock systems, you can have going to stock and domestic water supply system. So rather than having a, channeled, a channel system, um, you can go to a pipe with troughs. Um, we can do even things like the farm irrigation modernisation plan are eligible. So all the planning documents that are, are, are work. There's netting and windbreaks, water saving soil treatments and mulches. Temperature mitigation strategies to reduce overwatering. Uh, typically, shading, shade cloths, and those sorts of things will be eligible. Frost protection, which might include overhead sprays, the water reuse, uh, sort of glass housing and shedding of cat dairy cows, which I've talked about. So, transforming to intense production systems, sort of changing your permanent planning systems. Often, I know there's quite a few that we've done with changing both fruit varieties within fruit trees to a, to a, a 
a more water efficient fruit stock, often accompanied by a more modern and more valuable top, top part of the tree, if you like. The, then there's things that, are, that go along with that, like improving the energy system, the power system that can be used. Certainly solar power panels are, are eligible, that sort of thing. Uh, the costs that are around de permanently decommissioning part of a system are eligible. Um, and computerized automated system, and there's a lot, there's a whole list which yeah. you can just go to so the people website. Just, so go to the website because that, there is a very big long list um, of eligible projects. So uh, please uh, take advantage of, of going to the website to make sure that you can see where your potential project might sit in and amongst what is a, a long list of eligible projects. But Tony, if I might sort of pick you up on something there, why, why are the socio-economic impacts important? Let's see. The, why are the socio-economic impacts important? The, 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 the Basin Plan essentially says that the efficiency measures is uh, uh, in increasing the amount of water through the environment with neutral or positive socioeconomic outcomes. And, and there's been a, a, a long debate about what that means. And at the end of December, well, in December last year, Ministerial Council developed a set of criteria, or agreed a set of criteria to, to, that had to be met by every project proposal to ensure that those projects were deliver positive outcomes for basic communities. The process includes that all projects are assessed by relevant basin governments. And following that in principle approval, the projects will be published online for public comment on the department's Have Your Say website. The department has published a guide to addressing efficiency measures criteria, and that guide contains the criteria and instructions to insist with completing the project registration form. Okay. So the agreed criteria applies to projects in all five streams. What does it mean, and how do people know if their project meets the agreed criteria? So there are t it's a two-stage process to register your interest in the program. Uh, first stage is to ensure the program meets the commitment from the Basin Water Ministers made in 2018. We'll also com well, and the second part is, is ensuring that the project meets, complies with the common pro Commonwealth procurement rules. So a guide to addressing the efficiency measures agreed criteria has been published on our website for the ACT, New South Wales, South Australia and Queensland. Victoria is looking after projects in that state. The criteria seek information about the potential impacts on the project on issues such as local jobs, the water market and social and cultural issues, among other things. The criteria are designed to provide communities a greater level of assurance that projects will have neutral or positive socioeconomic outcomes, including protecting local jobs and agricultural production. The first question that has come in, Tony, is what if a project does not meet its target water savings? Um, I guess the, the program is, is designed, is aimed at ensuring that people do meet their target water savings. So the the all projects must be independently assessed by an expert to ensure that the water savings are realistic. In fact, not even realistic. It's, it's more conservative that we're aiming for. So we do, we do have both an assessment by the person that's doing it, and it has to be based on a level of evidence, and then an expert in that field, an irrigation design consultant or, a, or an agricultural scientist has to essentially put their their signature, their reputation on the line, that what what that project is proposing is realistic and will meet the water savings. So, because it is important, because a person gives up an entitlement or gives up water at the end of it, and and they do that, they get money for the entitlement. So, if you like, the water savings we get are locked in. Yeah. So, but it's important for us as part of that process that the water that people give up is realistic and, um, and is not going to leave the irrigator in a worse position. Tony, um, apart from the guide to addressing the agreed criteria, are there any other documents that may help people when they're filling out the, the registration form? So one of, the pub, one of the pluses of having a public consultation is that project proposals are published on the Have Your Say website. 
So even when the public comment period of 10 days is closed, the projects are still available. So there are currently two project proposals that have been published, and people interested in registering a proposal can see how others have addressed those criteria. Now, one of them is quite small. It's a South Australian that's only after about eight megalitres of water, where only saves about eight megalitres of water. And one of them is, is a fair size. It's a, about a 400 megalitre water saving proposal right. in Queensland. So you're uh -huh. seeing both a very small and a very and a quite big project. OK. Do you publish the name of the project proponent? No, the registration form is divided into five sections, and the responses in only two of those are published, and that doesn't include people's names. Okay. All right, so we've covered the process at the previous webinar, but as this program is a bit different to the others that the Commonwealth has run in the past, I suppose I, th I think there's value in, in going over the details again. So um, what is the process for project partners? So a project partner is an eligible water rights holder or their agents. So project partners can register a project proposal valued at over $1 million. So project partners are people seeking to directly enter into a funding agreement with the Australian government to manage their own project. To register their interest, a project must, uh, the business must, must be a legal entity and registered for tax purposes in Australia with a valid ABN, ACN and registered for GST an irrigator or a company that holds or uses eligible water rights, so they've got to hold, hold the water or, or at least be working with somebody that, that holds water. Um, for example, in, it's more, more with urban and industrial, they'll have to, many of those will have to work with a, uh, a town because they won't have their own water rights, they'll just be taking water out of, out of a town water supply or they have to own or operate a water delivery infrastructure within the basin. You must be willing to participate in public consultation process and able to provide evidence that the water entitlement have been held for a minimum of three years at the time of application. Projects will also need to deliver a minimum of 100 megalitres of water savings to the Commonwealth. So one of the, as I said, one of the projects on the website is a Queensland project expecting to save 400 megalitres of water and they are looking to be a project partner with us. And that's an on-farm project. OK, so that, that will be very useful for people to uh, have a look at those details. But can people use a delivery partner to manage a project? And if they do, how does that work? So a delivery partner is an organisation approved by and contracted by the Commonwealth to help eligible water rights holders to design and deliver their projects. They are organisations that provide a service. They provide project design and management services for water efficiency projects. So delivery partners can manage projects of any size, so all the way down to 10 megs or less and all the way up. Um, so water rights holders with a project under $1 million must apply through a delivery partner. We currently have five delivery partners and the department expects the tender again for delivery partners later, in, later this year on Oz Tender. And the department will publish details of all approved delivery partners so that people can get in contact with them. Okay, great. So what kind of experience does an organisation need to have to be a delivery partner? So to be a delivery partner, you must have experience in working and engaging with communities and the ability to plan and deliver projects administer funding, manage risk, and, all manage, and also manage the work, health and safety requirements. So successful delivery partners would work with water users in the basin to find, develop and gain approval to implement their projects and then manage the project, deliver the project and fulfil the monitoring and reporting requirements. So do projects that are submitted for funding consideration by a delivery partner have to address the socio-economic criteria and go through the public consultation process? Yes, all projects must address the socioeconomic criteria and the small project on our website was, was submitted by a delivery partner. So you have one project partner project and one delivery partner registered project on our website. So a delivery partner would help the project proponent to write their project proposal and address the criteria. If the project is agreed as meeting the socioeconomic criteria by the states and Commonwealth and meets all the funding requirements, a project work order under the delivery partner's contract with the Commonwealth would be negotiated. So a delivery partner, do they charge a fee for their services? They do. 
That's correct. Right. The administration fee charged by delivery partners would need to be met from the overall project funding. So we will pay up to 1.75 times the market value of the water. That is the maximum amount of funding that the Commonwealth make available for any single project. And that project, that project fee must cover both the project cost fee, the, prost, the cost of actually implementing the on-ground works, but also the admin cost fee. Proponents can also make a co-contribution of the project costs if this is necessary. So how do people find a delivery partner operating in their area? So we are, we are adding delivery partners to our website as they sign contracts with us. And those delivery partners, uh, that part of that is telling you what streams they're working in, because yep. not all of them work in all streams, uh -huh. and it tells you what states they're working in. Okay, great. So again, um, the website is obviously a, a place where people need to spend a bit of time to go and gather up some of this information. So uh, we've actually mentioned the, the public comment process. Can you explain the public comment process, please? <clears throat> so each proposed project is subject to a period of public comment. That's both projects from project partners and delivery partners. We will consider feedback when we decide if projects will be included or if funded in the end, if we're registered on, the, on our, if they're project partners. <clears throat> Um, and, and before they proceed to a technical assessment. Projects open for public comment are already assessed against the socioeconomic criteria by the relevant base of the state government and by the department. If people are interested in commenting on or seeing projects, go to the Have Your Say site on the Department of Agriculture's website and browse projects that are open for public comment and provide feedback using the online form for that project. So you'll need to register and sign in to provide feedback. And each project is open for public comment for 10 working days. Now, if it's a project in Victoria, then you'll need to go to the Victorian website to, to find those projects. Mm -hmm. So what happens after the public comment phase? So if there are any adverse comments, so there'll, be, there'll probably be some supportive comments, people are, we take those into account, but if there are adverse comments, yeah. The applicant will be invited to address those comments and the comments and the applicant's or delivery partner's response will be shared with the state government and we'll have another look at the, the project in light of those adverse comments. Mm -hmm. So following the public comment phase, the Commonwealth will complete its assessment of the proposal and make a decision on whether the proposal has merit and inform the applicant or the delivery partner. If the proposal has merit and it's a project partner, it will be placed on the Register of Potential Efficiency Measures projects, or if it's from a delivery partner, we'll proceed to a technical, technical assessment of the project. Okay, so if a project goes onto a register of potential projects, what happens to it? So in, again, what that larger project is exactly at this phase. We just put it on the register and now we're at the point of now deciding whether or not we will go forward with a tender process with that, that project partner. Okay, So right. it essentially goes through a, the, the, goes on the register and then at a, a time we'll make a decision as to whether or not to work, go to a limited tender with that project proponent. So, Tony, a question from the audience. We have a large local government project over two valleys. Is this possible? Absolutely. Um, I guess the, the question, let's see, it's, it's, yes, it's possible. Okay. Um, I guess that's the short answer. Yep. Um, it's, it's, if it's a local government project, then, then work with your state government would be the best thing to do. Yep. Um, we'd be obviously interested in what water entitlements, are there water entitlements coming out of both valleys or are, or are you aiming for a single set of water entitlements? Okay. But certainly, certainly, there's not a. So it's possible. It's possible. It's certainly it's possible to do it. But it'll, the devil's in the detail. The devil's I'm sure in the detail. In, in that's right. It, certainly, one of the things we've been working out is how do we deliver projects that cross over state borders. So local yeah. government's a minor issue, really, from that perspective. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That's fair enough. Um, and a uh, next question: Are you only looking for projects in the northern basin area? Uh, no, we're, we're interested in projects across the entire basin. Probably the the only area we're not looking for projects are in the very top end of the Condamine Ballon, and that's a that's a water delivery. 
problem. So yeah, okay. things around Tamworth or yeah. Granite Belt, then when then those ones no, okay. but but anywhere else, Northern Basin, Southern Basin. Uh, uh, it's, as we talked about, it's eligible in South Australia, Victoria, New South Wales and Queensland and the ACT. So projects in all of those jurisdictions and in every valley in the basin other than the very top end of the Condamine Ballon, um, then they're eligible. Okay, great. The next question is, are there targets in water streams from each stream? Uh, no. Um, we're interested in 450 gigalitres of water across the basin. Um, at this stage, we've got 1.9 gigalitres of water out of South Australia is the only water we've got towards that 450 at this, this point. So we've got 448.1 to go. And so we'll take it from anywhere, really. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, to the next question, will the states assess the socio-economic criteria in the same way? It's an it's, it's a interesting question and we don't know the answer to that yet. Uh, we are working with the state governments to, to gain a common understanding about what each of the criteria mean. The best, the, really the best way of people um, working out how to answer it is to is to use the examples, if you like, to use the ones that are on the website, so yeah. on Have Your Say. So that gives uh, people an understanding about how the different jurisdictions are interpreting the criteria. So we've got one from Queensland and one from South Australia up at the moment. As other projects put up, then they'll go through a state government assessment process and, and then we'll work from there to come up with a, a common set of, if you like, a common understanding about how people are interpreting the criteria. Great. All right. So um, the next question is, what types of projects will be funded? Um, I guess the, really, the short answer to that is, if it's a water savings project, then we're interested in it. I guess the, the, the five streams cover pretty much every sort of water use there is. Um, within that, <clears throat> we have a, a long list of eligible projects, which yeah, we hope we yeah. hope covers every sort of water savings Again, yeah, you, thing we, there well, is. Well, we went through some of them, didn't we? But yeah. encouraging people, go to the website because that big, long list yeah. is there. Yeah. So all the information's on the website, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Okay, great. So to the next question, the criteria are quite detailed. How can I be sure to address all of the elements that need to be answered? Um, we, we do have the guidelines, which are on the website, again, is probably the best way, because they do try to help people to answer, at least in a general sense. The, and then again, I'd encourage people to, um, to look at the ones that are on the, on the Have Your Say, because that'll, that will give an idea about exactly what we're after and how we're expecting people to answer it. Uh, we, we, we're entirely comfortable with the idea of um, people putting in short proposals to us that sort of say, this is the sort of idea I have. Yep. <clears throat> um, and we are responding to those. Yep. Sometimes it takes a little while, but we are responding to those proposals to try and give people some guidance about what's likely to get up and how they could answer the criteria. Well, I'm sure that would be very useful for people. Now, you, you have answered this question in the presentation, but perhaps for the benefit of the audience, uh, once again, <coughs> what are the socio-economic criteria? Um, there are a set of criteria, the 13 criteria that Ministerial Council agreed in December. Yep. Uh, it includes things like uh, the cultural value, cultural impacts of a proposal. It tries to avoid the impacts on water markets, jobs, those sorts of questions are what, the, what those criteria try to aim for. Uh, again, website's the best place. They're all up on the website to have a look at and as part of the part of the application form, you'll find the criteria in there. Um, use, use the guidelines, use the ones that are on the website to try and answer those questions. Okay. Uh, so, to the next question, uh, where can we go to determine the value of the water in a particular valley? Um, the department's website, 
again, has we do monthly reports. There's a bit of a gap at the moment in those monthly reports, but those there are a good place to start. Um, many brokers have websites which outline currently available water, things like Waterfind or uh, Rural Co, H2OX, all have publicly available information as brokers. Um, there's a there's a a new website called Waterflow, which uh, MJA, Marsden Jacobs Associates are doing, which has a, a very good website in terms of um, trying to help people understand water values yep. and it tracks water values. So you can see the graph that shows changes in water values over time. Yep. Um, so any of those, any public, there's lots of publicly available information on current water values. Okay. All right. Uh, okay, so the next question, what percentage of water savings are to be returned to the Commonwealth from projects under this program? Okay, so the two things are your water value times 1.75 gives you, a, if you like, a project value. Yeah. So if you want, uh, there's one, for example, that we were, uh, it was an industrial project where for that we're going to save about a gig a year from that industrial project, so 20 megalitres a week. Um, it was going to cost them $200,000. So essentially for, for that project, 10% of the amount of water they were going to save would need to come back to the Commonwealth in order to, to fund that works. Yep. So 10% is fine. We're happy to take 10%. If somebody else wants to do a project, and some people do, where they give up 100%, of the water because they um, they want to value add to their project and those sorts of things. For example, that date project I talked about, yeah. where they 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 took the extra money and put it into value adding within yeah. their their business and made an income stream from it. So we'll take you know anywhere ten to one hundred percent. There's no set set percentage. Okay, good to know. So th this is a, a good question as well. How long does it take for a proposal to be approved? It is a very good question. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sure it's got lots of answers. It, it does have, um, unfortunately How it does. How long is a piece of string? Uh, yeah, it, it, is, it is, unfortunately, that's, that's also true. Because uh, uh, there, are, there are many steps um, yeah. that once it comes to, to us, it goes to a state for assessment against the socioeconomic criteria. Uh, if, if a state has concerns with proposal, then it needs to go back to the proponent. They need to answer those additional, those additional concerns, those additional issues. If, if there are none, so that's, that's a generally a 10 day, 10 business day turnaround for a state to do the assessment. Yep. Then comes to us and we'll put it on the website and that's another 10 day yep. um, turnaround process. If there are no adverse comments, yep then it can go to a technical assessment if it's from a delivery partner, which we try to do within a couple of weeks or a few weeks again, and then get through an so approval. 20, 30, so you, 30 so, 35, 40. Uh, that's right. It, but each of those stages, if you have to go back to the proponent, yeah. if there are adverse public comments, yeah. then it needs to go back to the proponent, then it needs to go back to the state post those, adver those responses to those comments. Mm -hmm. So it's a... So, there's I mean, obviously, so there must be a lot of value, though, in getting the proposal right in the first place. Is yeah, that, so that's right, exactly. If, it's a, if, it's, if, it's, if a proposal is right in the first place, then you could get through it in a couple of months. Yeah. Um, so really, it, that's the encouragement to people is to, you know, go to the website, get the information, do the research, look at the examples that are there, follow them and you're probably going to, that's, that's going to mitigate some of that risk of delay. That's right. Yeah, okay. Um, okay, to the next question. Can an irrigation district propose a project? Uh, absolutely. Uh, I mean, uh, we are, we've been talking to some irrigation districts about proposals already um, and we would absolutely encourage an irrigation district to put forward a proposal. The, I mean, the, the absolute best value projects in terms of improving a farm's capacity to best manage their water is where a, a farm and a, within a, let's see if you like 
within an irrigation district and farms both do projects at the same time. Right. So irrigation district enable, it means an irrigation district can deliver water um, you know, quickly and easily and a, and a farm can make best use of that water. So it's absolutely irrigation districts, farms working together is, a, is an absolute out, great outcome from our perspective. Okay, great. So, Tony, if we might, um, what information is available for people who want to refresh their knowledge after this webinar? What sort of things are going to be there? We, you know, there are the eligible projects that, that we've spoken about, but yep. apart from the eligible projects, what other things might there be? Okay, so, so the things that are on there, in addition to the eligible projects, but also a guide to water valuation, um, and some links to where they can to, to get that information. Yep. A guide to addressing the efficiency measures additional yep. criteria. Yep. That's um, important. And, the, and the registration form for project proposals in New South Wales, the ACT, Queensland and South Australia. And a link to people in Victoria with an online inquiry form. Okay, great. So thanks, Tony. And thanks to you, uh, the audience, and to everybody who has submitted a question today. Uh, on behalf of the department, we're very grateful that you have participated and sent those questions through. So as I said, a list of all the questions we received will be placed on the department's website along with all of the answers and the recording of today's webinar and the earlier webinar and the questions and answers that went with that webinar. So again, please go to the website and that will enable you to go back and view, listen again to any parts of the questions that we've covered today. So Tony, thanks to you again for your time, for going through in detail to help people with the registration of their proposals. Okay, thank you, David. Thank you for the team here. Thank you again, Krista and Joe, and thanks to all our participants. Yes, thanks to you again, participants. Very good luck with those applications. And as I say, back to the website to all of that information. And thank you very much on, the department, on behalf of the Department of Agriculture for your uh, attendance on the webinar today. But for the moment, it's bye for now.